Welcome back to the life of Bam Margera. Last time, we talked about CKY's Infiltrate, Destroy, Rebuild. And this time, we're talking about Viva La Bam Season 1. Let's do this. In 2003, Bam Margera experienced a meteoric rise in his career, with the pinnacle of his success still on the horizon. This extraordinary year brought a surge in revenue, primarily fueled by lucrative skateboarding sponsorships that significantly contributed to his wealth. Notably, Bam's popularity soared to new heights, surpassing even legendary skateboarder Tony Hawk in skateboard sales right around this time. And soon, MTV money will be playing a much greater role in Bam's career. Briefly, for those embarking on a full-fledged jackass binge, there are intriguing cameos worth exploring around this time. Wee Man teamed up with Laban Fidesz in the skate tape American Misfits. Pontius made a memorable appearance in the film's Charlie Angel's Full Throttle. And additionally, as previously mentioned, Knoxville was featured in Men in Black 2. Hello, Bam. Hey, what's up, man? Bro. Love you, bro. <laughs> All right, easy, Greg. Oh. Lastly, in the realm of skateboarding, four of the Jackass members, including Bam, Aaron, Wee Man, and Preston, took on a starring role in the 2003 skate movie, grind. Unfortunately, the movie was kind of a flop, being criticized for its cheesy tone and lackluster continuity. But despite this, the intriguing aspect lies in the brief appearances of the Jackass members. And while some were brief, it was still interesting to see their cameos regardless. Yeah, I'm standing to bust you in your grill. Yeah, in your grill, dog! My yeah. grills? Is there some sort of barbecue later? However, perhaps one of Bam's most significant contributions to the skateboarding world was the creation of his own edition in 411 Video Magazine. Issue 61, amply titled The Bam Edition, sends out a testament to his impact on the skateboarding world, solidifying his status as a trailblazer in the industry. So let's jump in. Let's talk about 411 Issue 61, The Bam Edition. Element Skateboards is proud to present its newly signed 2003 and 2004 Pro Team. To include Jake Rupp, Tosh Townsend, Colt Cannon, Jeremy Ray, Kenny Hughes, Bill Pepper, Nades Capes, Vanessa Torres, and Bam Margera. In November of 2003, Transworld released 411 Issue 61, dedicated to Bam Margera. This two-disc DVD provides approximately an hour and a half of content, prominently featuring Bam and the CKY crew. The Margera experience begins about six minutes in, with Phil warmly introducing the tape and outlining the schedule for the day. And then we're going to have Controlled Chaos, chaos with Chet Childress, Pat Smith, Sneeve Nesser, and Mike Peterson in the chaos part of it. Scott Christensen, a bootleg am, Terrell Robinson, and a new birdhouse am, John Goman. Wait a minute, bam. As the scene unfolds, we find Bam and Ray casually lounging on a sofa in a staged living room set on the front lawn of the Margera household. But it's the BAM issue because a lot of that was BAM. Thank you, and go ahead and watch it and enjoy it. All right? Thank you. So as we all know at this point, my knowledge on skateboarding is very limited. Uh, so I'm going to be focusing mostly on the BAM section of this tape. BAM Margera fans will take the liking of a nostalgic treat in the form of an old audio commercial which features BAM. We dare not try to rationalize his actions and sit back in childlike glee as we watch his madness unfold. And unsurprisingly, BAM's spot check for this tape of course has to center around FDR Skate Park. He emphasizes the park's unique design featuring bowls everywhere, which helps eliminate the constant need for skaters to push. This stands in contrast to other places where skaters might find themselves repeatedly pushing for the same old ledge tricks that to Bam simply bores him. But FDR's skate park layout allows for a continuous and flowing ride, thus making it Bam's favorite. CKY cameos are scattered throughout this tape, with Chris Rabb, Ray Young, you know, the boys, all making an appearance. This is Don Vito, I'm calling 411. What the <laughs> hell is that? You can also notice Phil's hamburger shirt. It's one of the fun details indicating that this was filmed post the first episode of Evil La Bam. Another audio sponsored segment follows Bam on a road trip in Germany. Unfortunately, Bam was running late for this one due to a broken hand injury. He sustained this the night before while attempting to kickflip pivot on a log. He humorously apologized to the camera for the lack of footage, a consequence of his injury, because sadly, he couldn't participate in the demo. Well, ladies, sorry I'm ripping so hard in Germany. I know I have five times the amount of footage as everybody else does, and I just want to apologize. Fuck, it cut to a commercial break. 
Bam's profile on this tape captures a moment amidst the rise of his affluent lifestyle. Despite his love for traveling, Bam remains a homebody to Westchester. He expresses a core connection to his hometown, citing increased productivity when he's home. I go to California, as all I do is drink beer with Ben Affleck and then I go home. The tape showcases his upgraded home, a skatetopia both indoors and out. Bam also mentions that he's ever close to his Philly friends, proudly mentioning that he's only a 25 minute drive to the city. Recently, he stuck a deal with Audio, Element, and Destructo to collaborate on funds, thus securing a key to a skate warehouse called Borderline Skate Park, a skate park that he designed with Tim Glom, where he could basically just skate at any hour he desired. Now here's the issue number 62 plug, and it's the outro. So, bam, I gotta have this later done. The bonus content that came with this offers an additional 25 minutes of BAM-centric content. One notable segment features BAM's MTV trip to a German college campus, where he introduced him on stage. We will be dedicating a whole episode to BAM's relationship with Villa, but for now I'm just going to casually mention him, so just be prepared for that. However, he doesn't stop there. Immediately after, Bam is flown back to Philly to join Ryan Dunn. Together, they jet off to the Hamptons in New York for an MTV TLR event at a beach house in East Quag. MTV TLR refers to Total Request Live. Based on my limited knowledge, it was a television program on MTV that originally aired from 1998 to 2008. The show featured a countdown of music videos, and viewers could vote for their favorite videos to be included in the countdown. The format often included celebrity interviews, live performances, and interactions with the audience. And for this event, attendees were allowed to get shaved by both Bam and Ryan Dunn. But going back to the tape, there's a very special section in the tape called CKY Random Friday, as it dives into the brief origins of CKY and the band told in Bam's words. So Bam decides to take the camera to a closed CKY Westchester show. Personally, I kind of find this ironic because Bam was sort of mentioning how this is a closed show so the, all these fans are die hard being at this event, but like when the camera pans over to the crowd they just sort of like remain there like motionlessly like they're not, they're not moving at all. Anyway, we also got another Element demo in New Jersey, which also culminated into a CKY show. This, and a segment called Slapless in Seattle, displays Bam's fan dynamic. People take the liberty of being slapped by him. Getting slapped by Bam is like equated to a bizarre badge of honor. It's like akin to getting kicked in the nuts by Steve-O. Even though Bam does also kick them in the nuts, but the crowd just genuinely loves it. There's not a wheel of fortune in here. What's this? Oh, best 411, wheels of fortune, Bam Margera. This issue also includes throwback Bam Margera content, featuring his very first Wheel of Fortune entry. Additionally, it also features Bam's second Wheel of Fortune appearance that I didn't cover, where a young Phil reads off Bam's profile in the first person. I'm Bam Margera, and this is my pro setup. Here, he reveals his choice of Spitfire 52mm classic wheels. Bone Swiss bearings, Destructo trucks, and an Element Him 8x32 elephant board. Bam explains his preference for a wider board, attributing it to its suitability for the urban street environment that's found at FDR Skate Park. But in conclusion, this issue provides a wholesome and loved vibe of Bam Margera. It showcases his passion for what he does and his genuine connection with his youthful fans. For those who perceive Bam as spoiled and ungrateful, watching these segments may offer a different perspective and highlight his sincere engagement with his audience. If you're a Bam Margera fan, I highly recommend this tape. And so the era of Viva La Bam began on the Sunday Stew. Next Sunday in the Stew, an all new Viva La Bam. There's a family reunion in the works. <laughs> This whole family's crazy! It's true. Viva La Bam, next Sunday at 9.30. All new in the Sunday Stew. The Sunday Stew was a programming block that aired on MTV from 2003 to 2005, and it became an iconic part of the network's lineup. The Sunday Stew premiered with two new Jackass spin-off shows, Viva La Bam and Wild Boys, providing viewers with the chance to enjoy the antics of Bam, Sivo, and Chris Pontius on television. Additionally, the block debuted with the latest season of Punked, a fan favorite on the lineup. If viewers are looking for an authentic experience, I recommend watching all three shows concurrently as they aired live side by side. The Sunday Stew kicks off with the reruns of Viva La Bam and Wild Boys, conveniently scheduled alongside WWE's Sunday Night Heat on Spike. The lineup included Room Raiders at 8, 
and Punked at 8.30. The shows would cycle again, building up to the premiere of new episodes of Punked, Viva La Bam, and Wild Boys, and finally concluding with One Bad Trip. It's noteworthy to mention that the success of the Sunday Stew was not just about the shows, but the bumpers as well. The meticulous design process undertaken by Brand New School, a design company hired by MTV, designed the bumpers for the lineup. The director of the project, Jens Gelhar, went into detail on his website. The design process was simple, involving the camera panning from one side to another while four artists were assigned a chunk where they would inject a series of bizarre concepts to add a personal layer to the visual collage. A notable photo shoot of the staff dressed up was also featured in the production of it, and you can see them in different poses on the bumps. The Sunday Stew had undeniably become a massive success as well. The network celebrated its highest rated October in the coveted 1234 demographic. Punked emerged as the block's crown jewel, averaging a 2.8 national rating and drawing 3.56 million views. Viva La Bam claimed the second spot with a respectable 2.3 rating and 2.5 million views, while Wild Boys secured a solid 2.0 and 2.1 million overall views. But speaking of Viva La Bam, I think it's now time that we talk about the first season of Viva La Bam. While Wild Boys and Viva La Bam were spin-offs of the same show, the production teams of both shows had no connection to each other. Wild Boys fell under the traditional Jackass alumni, with Jeff Tremaine co-creating and producing the show alongside Trip Taylor. On the other hand, Viva La Bam had a distinct production setup. The show would be co-created by Troy Miller, a veteran producer known for his work on Mr. Show with Bob and David. Miller, through his private company Dakota Pictures, played a crucial role in shaping the aesthetics of the series. In addition, Bam would hire longtime friend and skateboarding carpenter Tim Glom to help Bam during the show. Bam met Tim way back in the 90s through Fairman Skate Shop, and he is the founder of SkateRamp.com, a company that is known for building custom skate ramps for the community. The production of Evil LeBam was contracted to be handled by 18 Husky, a company that the CKY crew did not get along with. The formula for the show unfolded in a distinct manner. Bam and the crew would brainstorm concepts for episodes, which MTV would either approve or deny. Once given the green light, Producers would draft the scripts, and the production staff would take it from there. However, the CKY crew disregarded the script given to them every single time. Ray loves these. Oh my god. And puts them on the Give floor by the Give door. Give me this, I'm gonna show you that this is the script, <laughs> and I'm gonna throw it out because that's what we normally would've done. Opting to do things however they want, with Bam taking the lead in all the decision making. This dynamic approach is vividly represented in the show's energetic intro, The King of Rock and Roll by Daniel Lyon Eye which is a very fitting anthem for Bam. What will he do next? Whatever the f I want. Who is allowed to do whatever the fuck he wants for the rest of the show. On the official MTV website, Viva La Bam's description states, Some say he's a skate guru who skidded face first down the vert ramp one too many times. Others claim Phil and April dropped him on his head. And he liked it. So they did it again. And again. And again. To those who know and love Bam Margera, He's merely a guy who likes to have fun at the expense of those he loves. Welcome to the manic world of Bam. Just make sure to watch your back. <coughs> Sorry, that was my uh, Kobe Sucks voice. I got really good at that since I did a Jackass Iceberg video with him. You guys should check that out. Here, I'll put a link there for you. And a year later, Viva La Bam would be published on DVD, presenting viewers with a treasure trove of bonus content. I'm talking bonus scenes, photos, four music videos, and what was called an uncommentary, which is basically a commentary that featured the whole cast. But before we dive into the first episode, it's also worth to take a moment to explore the intriguing narrative of the lost episode of Viva La Bam, the Iceland Waterfall. If we're in Iceland tomorrow, would you do the waterfall? Think about it before you say it. Definitely. According to Bam Margera, an entire episode of the show was created but was denied by MTV. This was due to being too easy to replicate. The episode was titled Iceland Waterfall. In this episode, Dunn, fueled by alcohol, enthusiastically told Bam at a bar that he would have gone over a waterfall in a barrel, reminiscent of one of their many trips to Iceland. He refrained from doing so back then due to the frigid temperatures, but this time, he definitely would do it. Bam, in a nonchalant manner, is going to put Ryan's words to the test. Bam was ready to fly the entire crew to Iceland, all with Ryan's somewhat intoxicated consent. We're going right now. The next morning, Bam woke Ryan and Rab, the latter now residing in Bam's basement closet, equipped with his own TV, VCR, and lewd content. Ryan, unfortunately, was oblivious and disoriented to what happened last night. 
Regardless, the group got their bags packed and began their commute to the Nordic Island Nation. The crew embarked on their usual shenanigans, making a pit stop at the Blue Lagoon Geothermal Spa, where both Bam and Joe took the opportunity to poke fun at Hannah's gut. <laughs> En route to the stunt site, Bam grew concerned as an unexpected storm resulted in flooded roads ahead. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> Alright, what's the worst that could happen? We could get stuck, stuck and have to fucking walk home. But what, we, what do you think the chances are? I think it's 50 50. Despite the risk of getting stranded in the middle of nowhere, Bam, determined as ever, decided to push through. Unfortunately, multiple flooded roads resulted in a wet engine and having the entire crew push the car uphill for it to dry out. The next challenge was finding a suitable barrel. The crew began to search for a barrel large enough to accommodate Ryan, finally arriving at a chemical plant. Unable to find anyone to talk to, Bam impulsively decided to hop the fence, dump the contents of a barrel, and just steal it. Ryan was left contemptuous. Dangerous, yes. Deadly, maybe. How nervous are you right now? I'm serious. I literally think I'm gonna die here in about five minutes. So I hope it's worth it and enjoy. Finally, after a four mile hike, the crew finally made it to the spot. The chosen waterfall presented a daunting split path, one smooth and another leading to dangerous jagged rocks. Dunn, understandably nervous, got into the barrel but immediately complained about it being too cramped, prompting him to abandon the stunt, disappointing the entire crew. After a heart-to-heart -heart conversation between Bam and Dunn, it was revealed that Dunn's genuinely afraid, and he lacked trust in the crew. Rab, having a moment of clarity, decided to empathize with Dunn in the moment, recognizing that he wouldn't want to attempt the stump either. Bam and the crew gave Dunn a little bit of space, and 10 minutes later, he gets up, and he's gonna give it a second attempt. He successfully navigated the waterfall, miraculously avoiding major rocks, only sustaining a head injury because Deco threw him in head first. The crew rushed to the freezing waters to save Dunn, just marking a powerful moment. Dunn emerged from the barrel in a state of panic, lying down to collect himself while the crew gathered to celebrate the triumphant end of another adventure in Iceland. This lost episode truly reflects the group's passion. There's an element of peer pressure when Dunn is intoxicated and pushed to do something he initially agreed to do, but it also showcases the group's commitment to pushing boundaries for content, and this refusal to accept defeat and leaving the situation with excitement highlights their dedication. Iceland Waterfall is now available in both SD and HD. It is definitely a must watch, enough said. Starting things off with Season 1, Episode 1, Phil's Hell Day. Five in the morning, I got my parents, Ape and Phil, asleep right here. I mess with Phil all day and he never gets pissed off. But today is the day I'm gonna make sure he loses it. In this episode, Bam orchestrates a series of mischievous pranks to test his laid-back father, Phil. He starts the episode off armed with a chainsaw, while also wearing an Escreppers t-shirt and a Yushanka. Here, Bam aims to make Phil's day anything but ordinary, promising a surprise reward at the episode's end if he's a good boy. The chaos begins at 5am when Bam revs up a chainsaw to create a makeshift fire pole, triggering the house fire alarm. Undeetered, Bam proceeds to his next prank at 6am, ironing hamburgers onto every piece of Phil's clothing. Ape attempts to protect Phil's wardrobe, but finds herself locked in a closet, narrowly escaping the injury where she almost got her arm caught in the iron board. At 8.30 a.m., Bam decides to fill Phil's toothpaste with raw meat, surprising everyone when Phil just plays along with it and just uses it. Phil then goes on a McDonald's breakfast run with Vito. The CKY group decides to add a hydraulic system to Phil's van. And an extra hash browns. Two. Two extra, three extra hash browns? Two. All right, two. After retrieving their food, while pulling out of the parking lot, the hydraulics of the car went off remotely, resulting in Phil and Vito struggling to hold onto their food, while the hydraulic system struggled to hold onto their weight, and eventually giving out as mentioned in the commentary. Midday, at 12.15pm, Phil is pushed to use the fireman's pole, a task that takes nearly an hour to do due to his fear. In a later twist, Bam and Deco take Phil's van into a junkyard, where they decide to dismantle it. Despite Bam's disappointment with the junkyard's false promises, uh, and that was to turn the vehicle into a perfect cube, Phil was more bummed than angry. I love that man, man. He's nuts. And in that surprising turn, Bam decided to make it up to him by buying him a new vehicle, and Phil quickly forgave him with a nice kiss. The second half of the episode takes an unexpected turn as Bam decides to pay for his parents' trip to Atlantic City for a romantic getaway. Deco and Rab play the role of limo drivers during this, but Bam's underlining plan actually involves inviting 10 pro skaters to transform his house 
into an indoor skatetopia, featuring $20,000 worth of ramps. The construction, led by Tim Glom of course, progresses smoothly until Jen realizes the potential damage that could destroy Ape's possessions in the house. While we're gone, I don't want a million people in here. Remembering the promise she made, Jen runs into the house and tries to save anything that she can, including an antique tea set that has sentimental value to Ape. Speaking of sentimental value, during the director's commentary, I found it interesting that Bam didn't really understand why Ape saw value in it, even though it was an heirloom from her great-grandmother. Ape, why are you attached to that thing right there that they're showing? That. It was my great-grandmother's. It sucks. It, it was your great-great-grandmother's, who I knew, by the way, and it's she was the most fabulous person. All those things. And now you're going to cherish the furniture? Bavarian yeah, Well, do you know what? It was just It's just a she... bent piece of glass. No, that's it. it's just that she always promised it to me. L -L. Amid this chaos, Bam's indoor skate ramps seek to impress Rion skaters, such as Tony Hawk, Bucky Lasik, Jesse Fritch, and Kevin Staub, all arriving for a demo. However, an unforeseen rainstorm dashes Bam's plans and leaves him stressed and disheartened. I don't care if it's rain or shine, we are shredding today. Despite this setback, the episode features a brief but intense skate montage, with Bam even sustaining a mild head injury during this action. As Phil and Ape return home, they are met with the progress of the house party, and Ape's reaction is nothing short but shock and fury. <laughs> However, soon after, they accepted what happened and began to join in on the fun. They did this by taking turns punching into the drywall while being cheered on by the revealing crowd, marking the unforgettable climax of Phil's Hell Day. Phil's Hell Day had a very stimulating plot that kept me engaged till the end. Bam's treatment of his parents, while a bit harsh, is still loving in a way. I think Bam tries a lot to be cool and overvalues his image, so he is trying not to project himself as a mama's boy. While the whole premise of the show is to torture his parents, it is noticeable that he does try to be thoughtful and loving to them in a very subtle way, and I think that is why he's misinterpreted a lot as being careless towards them. One of my criticisms for the show, which is more MTV's fault, is how this show is only 22 minutes. It was supposed to fit the programming block, I get that, but with the content that they filmed for this show, it could have easily been 45 minutes and entertaining. Ryan mentioned in the commentary that many of the pro skaters that they had on the show had no time to shine and got only a few seconds of screen time, and this is going to be a common issue in the show's future. One benefit of the DVD content, though, is that we get a director's cut of the second half of the episode, and this is definitely worth a watch on its own. It definitely helps the viewer feel more invested into the effort that went into the skate park. One thing showcased in this version is the feature of Jeff Raleigh, who basically just showed up, possibly did some kind of sit or something, and then just slept in the bushes all night. In the trees. I love the trees. Even when it started raining, Bam just ended up giving him an actual bed to sleep in and he just slept the whole day, which resulted in him not being able to participate in the demo and was, wasn't even in the episode, I don't think. In the episode Don't Feed Phil, Bam undertakes the challenge of testing his father's eating habits. You're out of breath. That's enough football. Diet. I can't do this. Let's find out how fat Phil really is. Armed with a scale, Bam starts the episode off attempting to weigh Phil, but the scale reads an error. Phil insists that the scale was made for children, but it had a limit of about 300 pounds. Do you think you could go one day without eating? Seriously, I could. No way! Phil and Ape head to the food fair unknowingly becoming subjects of Bam, Jen, and Rab's observations. Witnessing Phil's hearty appetite, Bam decides to put his father's ability to resist temptation to the ultimate test. At midnight, Bam adorned in corpse paint resembling Hank Von Hell from one of his favorite bands, Turbo Negro, he wakes Phil and informs him of the town's knowledge that he cannot eat for an entire day. Bam and Rab search Phil's office for hidden snacks, genuinely surprised by the amount they found. None of the stuff they found was even planted according to the commentary, Phil just really likes food. Next, the pantry undergoes a raid, with Bam expressing disbelief at the abundance of top ramen. At 8am, Phil attempts to satisfy his early morning hunger, only to encounter locked cabinets and a stern message from Deco on VHS. Deco's Don't Feed Phil performance is featured in the bonus content of the DVD, and it's amazing. You guys have to check it out if you're a Deco fan. I bet you're so hungry right now and so pissed off. Deco does an excellent job passionately eating cake and gloating about how Phil can't have any. A large amount of this episode's budget was spent on informing the entire town of Westchester to not feed Phil, even going the lengths to alert a local radio station to spread the word, and they bought a billboard on the side of the highway too. They found the damn mustard. Meanwhile, Ape shares gossip while working as a hairdresser, speculating on Bam's concern for Phil's weight. 
She believes the reason Bam targets Phil a lot for his weight is out of fear of losing him prematurely, and also that Bam could possibly be afraid of turning out the same way. Meanwhile, the CKY crew takes turns clocking in to ensure Phil complies to the challenge. Rab is first, driving Phil around facing denial after denial from every bar and restaurant they go to including a pizza place where they rejected Phil's $80 bribe. At 1.30, Deco clocks in and indulges in junk food during his shift, impressively dipping a triple-decker PB&J sandwich in milk. The commentary revealed that the outfit Deco is wearing for this scene is something he just sort of showed up with on his own accord. The bonus content also reveals a really funny Deco line while he was being harassed by a bee. I gotta fight you and a bee! And so Ryan clocks in and tempts Phil with coffee during his shift. I take this very seriously. How long do I have to do this for? leading to the arrival of Don Vito. Ryan informs Vito that Phil is restricted to water only, and the crew is going to be seeing Turbo Negro in Philly that night. Speaking of, Bam comically noted the resemblance between Hank Von Hell and Phil's physique, as they were hanging out backstage with the band. This episode was likely filmed on September 15th, when the band played the Theater of the Living Arts. I know a place will deliver a pizza. But it did not take long for Don Vito to suggest a pizza place far enough to be unaware of the challenge, and Vito tempts Phil with the idea of having two slices, with Don Vito devouring the other six. Ape then calls in to report on Don Vito's betrayal, leading Bam to decide that he's going to bring the entire band to his house for a spontaneous concert. Now back home, Don Vito denies knowledge of any plan to feed Phil, resulting in Vito getting a sudden makeup session and Bam reinforcing the challenge. The concert unfolds with a cameo by Joe Franz, and at midnight, Phil can finally eat food. Now blindfolded, he consumes a bizarre combination of foods. One example includes fruity pebbles, an olive, ice cream, and a potato chip all at once. Don Vito tops this off by drinking an entire bottle of hot sauce. The following day concludes with a gross-out moment involving Don Vito's toe, prompting even Ape to react strongly during the commentary, thus finally ending the episode. This episode was awesome, guys. I'm not going to do a conclusion paragraph for every episode here, so just bear with me that I don't hate this episode. I just don't really have a whole lot more to say besides that it's, you know, good. Just give me a blueberry because they're not really food. That's like fruit. Season 1, Episode 3, The Family Reunion. The family reunion begins with a PSA on bees by a beekeeper, something that Bam oddly disapproves of in the commentary because he prefers to go straight into the action for this episode. The episode starts with a prank on Rake, who was told to attack a beehive pinata, where, when hit, fake bees will fly out and be added in post. Bam was even able to persuade Rake to take off his shirt, citing that the pattern was disorienting the camera. <laughs> Rake, remember when you kicked in the A4? I'm getting you back now. Yeah. But in all reality, Bam just wanted Rake to get stinged more. He grabbed a bat and started attacking the hive. It didn't take long before he began to get stung, to the point of realizing that he was messing with real bees. Rake became enraged and began to flee. Who did it? That's your idea funny? Phil revealed actually that the group received a lot of hate mail for this one. The plot begins with Bam announcing a family reunion plan, with the help of Terry Compton and Tim Glom. He aims to transform a dull dinner into an exciting event. One quick note is that Glom's shirt from his company SkateRamp.com couldn't be talked about on the show for undisclosed reasons. Glom recommends remodeling the door to make it large enough to jokingly fit Phil's family, thus bringing up the idea of a drawbridge. They decide to use a blueprint on a loosely drawn piece of paper to create this drawbridge where the front door is, leading to a chaotic and spontaneous construction. You weren't even supposed to be there? No, you called me and said, dude, I gotta shoot an element at, I need a picnic table. I stopped by. And literally, there was one camera there, and he was freaking out, calling back to the office, going, They're gonna rip out the front door! The drawbridge was the most spontaneous thing we've ever done, ever. Because it was. It was dude, totally that, real. That ghetto-ass blueprint was the blueprint. Terry Compton adds energy to this episode, notably ramming an ATV into Tim's car. There was also a segment where they decided to bling bling Phil by heading to Philly to purchase gold fronts at a cost of two grand from a shady part of the city. The group also wants to build a moat underneath the drawbridge, so Deco calls in a bulldozer company to dig the ditch. That's simple. And by that night, they successfully built the door and a small moat. Ape is shocked by Bam's decision to invite the entire family for this event. Bam, while on his roof, reflects on his mom's side being chill and talented, while Phil's family might have been affected by living near the waste treatment plant. Mentioning in the commentary that Phil's side of the family all needs subtitles, but Ape's side of the family doesn't. Bam wants the family to dine in front of the home thus surrounding the drawbridge with a giant wall. Phil expressed concern about the wall violating HOA, and also giving Ape only a two hours notice to prepare for the arrival of the whole family. The CKY crew then embarks on a wild shopping spree, 
trashing the supermarket in search of everything they need for the family of 30. There is an extended cut of this featured in the bonus features. Accompanying Phil to pick up his mother, Bam acknowledges that Phil's mom is much more traditional and easily repulsed by Bam and Jess's actions. While in the car with her, Bam discusses the potential consequences of getting the word fuck tattooed on his chest to his grandma. I'm gonna disown you. By that point, both Bam and Jess were already out of their will. Is anybody left in your will, mom? Who, uh, Jesse is, right? No, he, he wasn't a virgin until he got married. Later, the crew gathers, and as the food arrives, a grappling hook tears down the wall, revealing an elephant and the crew striking poses. The elephant costing 20 grand scares Ape. Interestingly enough, the crew was able to get the jail's approval to let Phil's brother Pat out of jail, with the presence of a parole officer for the event. The family then begins the feast. However, Vito, now drunk, is eating whatever is given to him, including a pig eye and a cigarette. Ma Mom looked visibly vexed and became frustrated towards Vito, recalling a past incident in Florida where Vito blacked out over a day due to excessive substance use. Overwhelmed, Mama decides to leave, blaming medicine complications and drives away while calling the whole family crazy. And while Compton walks around with the pants that sag so hard that you can see all of his boxers, the episode takes a more serious turn. Concord Township Zoning Violation Enforcement Notice Bam shows a zoning code violation dated on October 6, 2003, reporting the sighting of an elephant on their property, resulting in a $600 fine. Despite receiving a thank you note from neighbors, Bam expressed his disdain towards the township for their violation warning. They kind of deserve it, though. Uh, no, that was a warning. They were staying way far back, and you ruined it. Now they've been assholes the whole year. No, they they have jerk off. They have been. Again, I, I, bam, I go to court and they were nice. You know yeah, what? I gotta say, they no. were pretty cool. But they gave a shit they, for a whole year. F*** those jerk offs. They did not. That was the first morning you got and you met. Dude, I, I've been in townships where I get kicked out for parking on the wrong side of the street. They I were wanna, super cool. I want a written apology from them. And consequently, calling them out like this made the situation much worse later in the series. The episode was a really fun watch though. Two interesting notes is that there's a funny bonus scene where Bam persuades Rake to jump across the moat, <laughs> then do it again while holding three bricks. However, when a fourth brick is brought up, Rake starts to refuse, until finally accepting a deal to just jump into the moat for $3. Glom also threw his keys in there, but I think that went a little too far. Another interesting note is that Tim Glom admitted in the commentary that the insurance company for his business saw the episode and dropped doing business with them altogether. And then Phil reveals to Bam in the commentary that the same thing happened to his insurance company for the house due to Bam's risky lifestyle. Oh, I don't have my wallet either. Oh, jeez. Season 1, Episode 4, Viva La Vegas. Viva La Vegas was where Don Vito's character really started to shine in the series. Ape and Phil's anniversary was approaching, and Bam is on a quest to find a mail-order bride for Chris Rabb, whose fate was sealed by the flip of a coin. Bam, in his signature style, dropkicks the door to wake up Phil and inform him about the upcoming renewal of his vows with April, at the same time as Chris Rabb's wedding. We go to Vegas, you don't tell Ape about Jack Phil nonchalantly approved and then just quickly fell back asleep. Bam would then share the news with Ape, who had immediate concerns. She became worried about how to break the news to Chris Rabb's mom, but complies regardless. In the commentary, Bam and Ape playfully bicker at each other. You know, you jerks, like, get me at the worst possible time. Yeah, all all the you time. do is wake up and wash shit and do dishes. You should be the new Martha Stewart. Every time I come over, you're fucking cooking something. It's, it's what I do. The crew then heads to Vegas, kicking off the trip with some tattoos. Don Vito receives a heartogram tattoo on the softball-induced dent on his back. Don actually helped with this tattoo, but it goes unnoticed in the episode. Bam, meanwhile, gets a tattoo himself on his forearm. Bam's goal for Vito is to fulfill four regrettable tasks. Upon arriving at the suite, Phil and Ape are pleasantly surprised by its size, while Vito is assigned a cramped 5x7 space, leading to his immediate frustration. Rab is then outfitted for his wedding, and the crew goes to pick up the mail-order bride after she suffered several layovers. While Rab was looking good at first, bonus features revealed that he was rolling around in the parking lot to purposely look like shit. Yeah, <laughs> while finally being able to meet Rab, while she did barely speak English, her body language told it all. She was not interested in Rab whatsoever. In the next scene, Vito receives an electric bike to explore Vegas, engaging in a wheelchair race and later getting evicted from a casino. Bam strikes a deal with the dealer, ensuring that regardless of Vito's actions, he would secure a hit in blackjack. However, it doesn't take long for Vito to become belligerent and excessively touchy with casino security. 
leading to his second regret of losing all of his money and the third regret of getting kicked out of a casino. Because they kicked me out for no reason. Yeah. Rab and his bride would spend the next five hours enjoying Vegas, all while Bam would do some shredding with the boys. Rab admitted in the commentary that he was faking it for the camera, but we never really knew for sure. The family and Rab's bride indulge in some spa treatments, and during this, Vito is pranked with a blue hair job. He's also given a soul patch made from Bam's body hair. But it's actually Rake's asshole hair. Phil looks like shit. He's so cute. No, he, he looks, looks like good a there. Bad <laughs> he looks good there. He looks good. Nah, he doesn't. In the commentary, Bam teases Phil once again for his weight, mostly boasting about how his diet of Jack and Cokes kept him thin during this entire trip. That was a four day vacation. I had nothing but Jack and Cokes. Watch you, this, watch how this. How do you feel? The group then takes a limo to the wedding, with Vito expressing his concerns for Rab. You want to take half your money? Because his <laughs> mind, he's still living in the 80s during the Reagan era. Yeah. You know? So, like, a guy like that stays at the prime of his life and doesn't progress. Yeah, he's so in, he still thinks she's a commie bitch. Yeah, he's which is what he would call her right then. <laughs> and causing the male order bride to become belligerent back towards him. But despite the chaos, Rab's wife actually receives Vito's blessing after that. In the commentary, Ape and Phil admitted that the bride may have cheated on him between the wedding and this reception. It was also revealed years later by Rab that Bam actually slept with the mail order bride as well. But she, she seemed to have like a meth mouth when she got there. I wasn't too into it, but um, and uh, he he slept with her. I did not. It, uh, it was actually a thing. Phil, in an Elvis getup, expresses his love for Ape as they renew their vows. Rab follows suit with the two couples enjoying the moment. However, Bam finally reveals to Vito that the soul patch is made out of his body hair, leading to Vito's outrage. Since Vito ate the wedding cake at their original wedding, Ape decides to get back at him by throwing the cake at Vito's face, sparking a whole food fight between the crew. The mess of this food fight actually accumulated a cost of $40,000 in damages and cleanup fees by the hotel. Despite this episode, Rab didn't officially marry the bride. I wanted to marry her. Um, just because at that time in life, I was just kind of a maniac, drunk, idiot. But MTV wouldn't allow me to legally sign the documents. And thank God, uh, MTV Legal, Ken Parks came in and was like, Ah, don't be doing that, Rab. <laughs> a huge bonus feature for this episode includes Rab and Phil's participation in a Justin Trans hypnosis show. where Rab was believing he is Elvis and argued with another guy on who was the real Elvis. Hypnosis like this is really interesting to see, and I think it makes a great addition to the bonus content. But overall, this episode is the first travel episode of the show. I found that the Vito segments outshined the Chris Rab A plot. However, it's wild just to think about all the money that was spent in this episode. Season 1, Episode 5, Three Day Weekend, also known as Paint Phil Blue. Ape, Phil, and Vito are granted a three day weekend, giving Bam more time for his signature shenanigans by dedicating a day to fuck with each of them. The episode kicks off with some skateboarding action with the boys, featuring spots on the newly installed Death Hole on Bam's vert ramp. Bam and the others then head to Vito's house, initiating a plan to dig a 30-foot tunnel underneath the Vito household. Meanwhile, Rab and Dunn were tasked with keeping Vito distracted as the digging process takes longer than expected. The crew takes Vito around town to Hooters and Duffers, engaging in activities like playing pool and drinking. During their outing, the notorious Vito chokehold is brought up, resulting in a humorous altercation between Rab and Dunn. Hours passed, and around midnight, Bam and the gang successfully complete the tunnel, drilling a hole underneath Vito's floor. Dude, I was sawing Vito's rug right there, and he is the filthiest fucking rug, dude. He does not vacuum at all. It smelled all. so bad. It smelled it's so rough. goddamn bad. Like, yeah. dude, any dog that ever visited him was still there. But finally, around 2.30 in the morning, everything was complete and ready for tomorrow. And that morning, the crew goes back into the tunnel and surprise Vito with a good morning, leading to one of the funniest Vito responses in the entire season. What are you retarded the focus then shifts to April. Uh, Rab takes April's car keys and goes for a drive, upsetting April immediately. Bam reassures her that Dunn is just simply borrowing it for a few days, while in reality, the crew is going to give the car a complete makeover. Uh, Villo Vallo also makes a surprise cameo, and uh, during the commentary, Bam predicts that people will regret not giving him enough screen time in this episode. Bonus features go into more details on the modifications put on the car, and all the groove effort that went into it. Meanwhile, Rab's activities involved getting loaded and taking a break. Man, they're out there working on that car all sweating up and getting all in there with them tools. I'd rather be doing what I'm doing right here, you know? Later, Ape is finally shown the pipped out car, 
featuring flaming decals and a prominent Cobra shift knob. It was mentioned in the commentary that the front wheel rims were not staying on, so Dunn improvised by super gluing them. Lastly, Bam sets his sights on Phil, asking him his favorite color and being surprised that he actually has to go to Ape for the answer. He's good at it. Most men say blue, so I'll guess blue. So Bam decided to have everything in the kitchen painted blue, even the food in the fridge. Despite this, Phil just still takes it in stride and calls it decorative and designish. The grand finale involves putting Don Vito and Phil into a chamber, with Vito persuaded by a hoagie and a promise for money. The two are plastered with various food items, including flour and maggots, creating a smelly and hard to breathe environment. Vito, enraged that he had money glued with honey on his back, decides to destroy the pod in a Godzilla like manner. But he breaks the deal by spitting it out, but he ended up just running away, leading to a chase on an ATV near the end of the episode. This episode is deemed memorable by fans, particularly the segment where the entire kitchen is painted blue. Even years later, Ape still discovers traces of blue paint, easily one of the most talked about points in the series. And notably, you could tell that the front lawn has become so much dirtier since the start of the show. Watch Karate Kid kick right into it. Boom! <laughs> yeah! You were Van always Halen. good at that! That was David Lee Roth right there. Season 1, Episode 6, Very Merry Margera Christmas. In this Christmas special, Bam and Phil go to the basement to decorate the house, but his dislike for their old antique decorations prompts him to take matters into his own hands, thus reaching out to Tim Glom on finding more modern decorations. Humorously, the two went to a local hardware store and were surprised that they didn't have enough lights for the house. Glom, disappointed in wasting time, decides to make a call. As a result, Four whole trucks filled with lighting and decorations arrived on the property. Glom and Bam weren't satisfied with the company that they actually went with for this. Yo, Glom, did you know that I flew to London and when I was flying back, one of these dudes was just like, Yo, you assholes, fucking... Shut, dude, they won't hurt. Just stop. Right, never mind, I'll stop now. <laughs> In phase two of the Christmas extravaganza, Bam acknowledges his naughty behavior and transforms the entire living room into an ice skating ring. The crew engages in a humorous ice hockey game, using hamburgers and breakfast sandwiches as projectiles while Phil plays as goalie. Ryan then enters the scene with a makeshift Zamboni, humorously labeled a Bamboni, constructed from his nephew's four-wheeler. Rab also adds to the entertainment with a stunt that involves taking puck shots, but then this transitions on to Ban going the extra mile by hiring figure skaters to perform on the ice, and Ray humorously mentions in the commentary that he tried to get with one of the figure skaters but he failed miserably. Ape surprisingly doesn't express much displeasure towards this particular antic. She appreciates the presence of the figure skaters and enjoys her time on the ice. The boys also received a visit from the Bloodhound Gang, joining in on the hockey action. Phase 3 of the Christmas festivities, Bam introduces a snow machine from Georgia to blanket the house in snow, completed with actual blocks of ice. The crew then engages in some mischief, by force feeding an intoxicated rab, a sandwich, and dry oatmeal, discovering that the oatmeal surprisingly makes good vomit. And in a bizarre and classy turn of events, Bam decides to barf, pick it up, and then eat it in front of his mom. Dude, it was in your mouth. You don't want puke from your own son? The group continues to play more ice hockey, further messing with Rake. A funny moment happens where Rake actually takes a shot in the nuts. In a moment of fleeing, Rake actually falls out the window, hitting his head and dropping five feet. Yeah, he didn't know it was that Nobody far. It was, so nice far down. it was worth it. <laughs> leading to his desire for payback. He does this by arming himself with an ice launcher. However, this backfires as Rake comically falls over. With snow do you overrun yeah, and drip look, on your Rake show? tries to do something, look, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> Ryan then contributes to this by loading the machine with more than just ice, such as raviolis, frozen peas, and most painfully, an apple. Vito then arrives on scene and begins complaining that Christmas hasn't even arrived yet, having endured a snowy pumbling that resulted in wet pants. In a transition shot, Bam throws a snowball at the camera lens, but it gets hilariously destroyed. In Phase 4, the Christmas special takes a festive turn with the reveal of the lights and decorations adorning the house. However, both Glom and Bam found themselves unsatisfied with the outcome, prompting them to bring in spotlights to illuminate the entire neighborhood. The festivities continued with a wholesome moment between Vito portraying Santa and Bam. I want a football. <laughs> Where have you been? I don't think you're going to get anything. You're not going to get me anything? Not this year. You're a f***ed up Santa. As the night falls, the crew begins to decide to play a prank on Deco. They fill his shoes with a combination of thumbtacks, cough drops, and other items, setting the stage for a surprise. Armed with a vacuum cleaner, they proceed to scare Deco by sucking on his lips. The trick works, leading to a tired but awakened Deco, concluding the episode after he fell for the prank. Ow! 
The episode wraps up with a mix of festive cheer and the presence of a choir and the camaraderie of the crew. In the bonus scenes, the crew adds another layer of amusement by creating a giant wiener. Additionally, there's a funny short scene of Vito, Dunn, and Hannah pretending to ice fish inside the house, and Vito complains about how they aren't actually catching any fish. Vito, fish in here! Ain't no fish in there. This episode was alright, but I think it was probably the weakest of the eight. It did keep me engaged through it all, as every episode has so far. However, it felt like it would be more awkward to watch live, especially since this aired on November 30th, like a whole month before Christmas. I personally think this should have been a special, and I think the Iceland waterfall would have fit perfect right here. Season 1, Episode 7 April's Revenge. In April's Revenge, Bam and his friends are preparing the Margeras for a plan to ditch them on a deserted island for 24 hours. The Margeras and the crew boarded a boat. These boats started to take on water. For and real. We were passing all kinds of no. equipment back no, and forth. No, 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 no. Don Vito was so fucking heavy, the boat sank. Full blown. The boat sank, and we all had to get on another fucking boat, but we never shown it. I don't know why, but it was. Their intended destination is near Three Mile Island. The Three Mile Island nuclear accident took place on March 28th, 1979, conveniently on Ape's birthday. The root cause of the accident was a combination of equipment malfunctions, design-related issues, and operator errors, leading to the overheating of a reactor and the release of radioactive fragments of gases and iodine. It was deemed one of the most serious accidents in the American commercial nuclear power industry. Cleanup efforts totaling about a billion in funding had a positive effect, and fortunately, it's also worth noting that most of the contaminants were iodine-131, which has a half-life of only 8 days. Therefore, it wasn't comparable to a second Chernobyl. And by 2003, the water was declared safe and no longer posed a threat. Upon arriving on the island, Vito immediately became upset and resorts to his usual routine of complaining and sitting down. They're planning to leave us here, right? Yes, they are. I can tell. Tell, tell. And decided to take matters into her own hands by boarding the boat with Phil and Vito and abandoning the crew. Bam warns Ape that this will be the worst decision of her entire life. I have a cell phone in my pocket and I believe me, I have connections. A side note, you see that the football that Phil's holding in this scene, he actually threw that to Deco and uh, Deco caught it, but it wasn't, it wasn't included in the episode. Bam contacts his friend Harrisburg to drop a care package of goods and he enlists Tim Glom to bring his equipment and save them. Glom arrives on a boat, but is only dropped off and foolishly forgets to give Bam and the crew a ride. You think we could build a half pipe? I'm telling you, dude. You give me seven minutes, roll of duct tape. Bruh. Bam decides to commit to the 24 hours, so he ends up getting Glom to construct a mini ramp out of duct tape. As the crew prepares for their night of partying, Strike Anywhere can be heard in the background. Meanwhile, the camera goes back to Phil and Ape relaxing and eating a really nice sandwich. And I'm supposed to feel bad about him being on an island? I mean, how crummy is that? I hope they're all having a fun time. Now back on the island, Bam and the group skated on the makeshift ramp. Glom, having lost an undisclosed bet, is actually seen naked during this scene. However, the crew's good time takes a turn for the worst as rain began to pour onto them, prompting them to attempt to build a hut. Ryan does note at this point that only him and Glom are putting in the effort. While Rab is lying there and complaining about Dunn's job, Dunn decides to spray Rab with the fire extinguisher to get back at him, leading to serious inflammation on Rab's face later on. In a bonus scene, while hungry, the crew decides to place a can of baked beans directly on the campfire. But those beans are good. Fuck. Causing it to explode and scaring everyone, especially Bam. Also not featured in the episode, Rake successfully catches a Three Mile Island catfish and makes it kiss Glom. Feeling somewhat guilty, Ape finally sends Vito to the rescue. If we go back, they're gonna leave us there. Let's just send Don Vito over. However, Bam rejects Vito's help, which is fine because Vito per kind of prefers to just sit there and drink with the crew. Vito hangs around for a little bit, but he eventually leaves after feeling offended from being farted on too much. At 7.30 a.m., Bam, feeling miserable and tired, decides to take time to get back at Ape. They start a fire, attempting to burn down the entire hut. Best I, part about this is when our producer, Bruce, just finally gave up on us. Yeah. <laughs> we were supposed to burn the whole hut, but they wouldn't let us. Yeah, so we did anyway. He just took his walkie off, just gave up. Bam calls Ape to arrange for pickup, only to discover that Ape had nothing planned for the rescue, assuming that it was being taken care of. Disappointed, Bam instructs Ape to watch the 6 o'clock news, and then tells Glom to make up a plan to get him off this island. He cuts down a log and throws it into the water, attempting to use it as a makeshift raft, all while enduring rain and 37 degree weather. When paramedics finally reach Glom from this scene, he actually collapsed after the hyperthermia for floating around for two miles. Glom returns with the boat and saves the crew. Meanwhile, news of the incident finally reaches April while she's at work. The reporter asks for her comment on what happened to her home earlier that day, 
revealing footage of the house exploding akin to the movie Independence Day. Despite the cheesy CGI, Ape believes it and freaks out, racing home in panic, believing that the house is gone and everyone's dead. Upon arrival, she discovers the house is intact, and with the crew waiting for her. You left me on an island. Ah, that's awesome. Was that the worst ride ever? It was a bug. Good. But ultimately, the two agreed that they are even and shared a nice hug, bringing the episode to a very wholesome conclusion. Also, Ray Yun got poison ivy on his ass. And lastly, Season 1, Episode 8, The Scavenger Hunt. The Scavenger Hunt was an episode dedicated to the competition between four different derby cars. The goal is to score as many points as possible on a 51 item list, and with 6 hours on the clock, they have to compete as many of the 51 challenges as possible. Each team will be assigned a car, with April's job to keep track of the phone calls and to handle the score. Interestingly enough, a viewer mentioned to me that the introduction of this episode was cut from the DVD release. I know, well I said do what you want. I will. The premise was that Ape was complaining about a piano they owned. She was practically asking Bam to find a way to get rid of it. The DVD, however, kicked off with a bang as Bam immediately crashed into the garage door, setting off Ape's immediate dramatic reaction. <laughs> Bam excitedly announced the scavenger hunt with four cheap derby cars that he got for $500. The grand prize? The winner gets to wreak havoc on Ape's piano. The action then shifted to a montage at the junkyard, where the teams design their vehicles and prepare for the chaotic adventure. The teams included Narkill, featuring Jason Ellis, Tim O'Connor, Bam, and Mark Hanna. Policia, featuring Rab, Ryan, and Vito. Ladyboy, featuring Rake, Deco, and a friend of Deco named Lunchtime Lendon. And lastly, the Bloodhound Gang. Hell so I've yeah. mentioned the Bloodhound Gang quite frequently so far, and I've never really explained who they are. The Bloodhound Gang is a rap rock alternative rock group that formed in 1992. The main members of the group at the time were frontman Jimmy Pop, bassist Evil Jared, drummer Willie the New Guy, guitarist Lupus, and DJ Q-Ball. You can tell by their names that they're a bunch of weirdos. The band is known for their abnormal crass vibe at their shows. This guy, he's gotta get completely naked and I'll give him $20 and a Bloodhound Gang t-shirt. By this point, they've released three records, Use Your Fingers, One Fierce Beer Coaster, and more popular, Hooray for Boobies. Their lyrics are always full of innuendos, controversial topics, and pop culture references, with their most well-known track being The Bad Touch. Put your hands down my pants and I'll bet you'll feel nuts. One of my more favorite peculiar tracks by them is The Lap Dance is So Much Better If the Stripper is Crying. Observing their live shows, it became evident that the Bloodhound Gang was almost like kindred spirits to the CKY crew with their chaotic, raunchy, and crude atmosphere surrounding Bam's circle of friends. It is worth noting that for this episode, Evil Jared was arrested and fined. Jared was arrested for attempting to urinate from the top of a parking garage into a Dixie cup held by Jimmy. The police arrived and arrested Jared and resulted in a 10k fine and community service. Despite rumors, this incident had no relation to the title of their next album, Hefty Fine. The competition begins with Lendon giving Bam a wedgie, earning Ladyboy an early lead. Nardkill ends up picking someone else's nose and eating the booger, while Ladyboy gains 20 points for getting spit at by a llama. The Bloodhound Gang secured 40 points for bowling a strike with cheesy shoes. Uh, Ladyboy actually convinced Vito to persuade a girl to try on lingerie, which isn't really that hard to do, let's be honest. Outside, a beeping noise startled Ape, who is inside counting score, as she notices a wrecking ball appearing on her property thus surprising her. Ape, worried about losing windows, makes a call to Bam, but he could only promise uncertainty. The challenges continue with Polisa, Ladyboy, and Bloodhound Gang successfully getting a frozen turkey in a hole. However, Bloodhound Gang got criticized for not throwing it through a window. Deco showcased his bowling skills in this while wearing Nacho Cheese shoes, securing a strike and propelling his team to the top spot. Meanwhile, Bam opted for a traditional shopping cart slam. Ladyboy and the Bloodhound Gang took on the challenge of consuming six raw eggs, with uh, Jimmy Pop dowsing them all in one sitting, displaying some genuine discomfort until he finally let it all out. Bam was pushed into mud from a swamp sewage runoff, which put him at risk of getting sick. The Ladyboy maintained their lead, but Jason Ellis earned points for making out with a girl in front of her boyfriend and getting kicked out of that same store, putting Narkill back in contention. Ryan got a math problem tattoo of 5 plus 4 equals 9, and Rab and Don both convinced a girl to, uh, to fly, to, uh, yeah. In a peculiar turn, Bam inhaled a Mark Hanna fart. In exchange, Hanna would later kiss Bam's ass. Bam got the chance to piggyback a cop in this. The Policia faced additional challenges when their vehicle broke down. 
Unbeknownst to them, evil Jared from the Bloodhound Gang had tampered with the radiator cap, leading it to overheat and break down. Meanwhile, the Ladyboy's cameraman vomited and caused them to miss two stunts, adding even more tension on who would win the competition. With just 19 minutes remaining, Bam finally returned home, and the rest of the team arrives with the Policia team finally making it back on a tow truck. The results were tallied, placing Bloodhound Gang in fourth, Ladyboys in third, and Narkale barely securing the win. Vito's frustration over a non-tongue kiss led to Bam's decision to drop the piano 20 feet into the Policia's vehicle. Rake mentioned hate mail from people in England, apparently, criticizing the crew for wasting a perfectly good piano. This episode had the most bonus footage out of any other episode this season, totaling a whole half an hour of antics. Some interesting moments include the crew attempting to snag an American flag from someone's yard. But that backfired. A team decided to walk up to someone thinking that they were a bum to sign a pizza box, but it turns out that he wasn't homeless and they kind of unknowingly racially profiled this guy. The Bloodhound Gang, however, did this successfully. In the most profound, Bam's team got roadkill and brought it into the kitchen. There was a lot I didn't cover for this one, so I highly recommend you check out the bonus content. Just 24 hours later, the Margeras received yet another township violation notice. This time, the infractions include home modification without notice, illegal skating events, noise ordinance violations, construction without a permit, and the construction of an illegal castle wall. The culmination of these violations led to the family being evicted from the township. Bam, in his typical style, declared it was time to move anyway, concluding the episode with an unexpected twist and leaving viewers intrigued about what the crew would do next. Viva La Bam Season 1 was quite the mouthful. However, I feel it presents a fascinating progression, particularly in how the Margera residents transformed over the course of the episodic show. Initially adhering the HOA guidelines, the clean, well-kept house reflected the standard expectations. However, as the season unfolded, Bam's decision-making took center stage, resulting in a gradual shift towards a more chaotic and messy environment. Bam's disapproval of most of the soundtrack added an interesting layer to the complications between Bam and the production crew. Despite his preferences, a few songs like Turbo Negro and Narkill Tracks were the only songs that Bam enjoyed that made into the episodes, which added to the constant disagreements between Bam and his friends and the production team. Notably, in the last episode of the season where the crew planned to smash the piano, a Cradle of Filth song played in the background of the shoot, although The Post decided to not include this and decided to go with something else. Throughout its run, Viva La Bam remained constantly entertaining. Despite the show's episodic nature, the content remained engaging, and the 19 to 20 minute runtime often felt too short considering the wealth of the material they captured. What set Viva La Bam apart was its departure from the typical California reality show archetype. Instead, it chose to sort of unfold in the middle of an East Coast rural town of Westchester, providing a more authentic and organic vibe. The cast, while exaggerating their characters for entertainment, retained a very genuine quality on camera, and Bam's unapologetic approach to doing whatever he wanted became a defining feature of the show, contributing to its unique charm and making Viva La Bam a standout reality series in its own right. However, I would like to add that it's starting to become more evident that Bam's celebrity status is starting to affect his attitude. While sweet little old Bam Bam is still at his core a very kind and down-to-earth guy, his constant positive reinforcement for his impulsive and sometimes ego-driven personality is starting to become noticeable, especially in the commentary. Additionally, with this demanding MTV schedule, Bam will be dedicating less time to skating, potentially transitioning from a skateboard legend to just another MTV celebrity, as we'll learn that getting the ability to do whatever the fuck you want is going to start to come with its consequences. But that's all I can say today, guys. I've covered a lot in this episode, so we gotta move on to the next one. Thanks for watching, guys. Follow me on this thing. Follow me on at thing. Support me if you can. Um, have a good one.